Uh, I'm ready for a procedure. That's why I'm wearing this mask. Um, can you guys actually? I can't. I don't know. Start video. All right. Uh, joke lands a lot better this way. Sorry. Um, so we're going to talk about super pubic catheter placement. Um, so just to get started, first a big thank you to the procedure team. Um, they gave me some good insight and some good feedback on this, um, and they put up with my uh, my deadlines and stuff. So I appreciate it very much. Uh, learning objectives: We're going to give a little bit of background on acute urinary retention. Talk a little bit about you know, super pubic catheter placement versus urethral catheter placement and review the procedure. And then also talk a little bit about how to troubleshoot these things when they come into the ER and you're a little bit like, what do I do? So a little bit of background, it's not just elderly people. Um, and the thing that I, I took away from this is your symptoms are kind of based on your age. Uh, patients that have hesitancy and nocturia, um, those are the main ones that present uh, in the men group age 30 to 40. Um, they have a very high risk of acute urinary retention. And the pain is very similar to renal colic, but obviously urinary retention is a lot more expensive and causes a lot more ED visits than your uh, renal colic does. Uh, BPH will happen in about half uh, men throughout their lifetime and women and kids have acute urinary retention as well. But the thing is those causes are a lot more scary. So you gotta really think about why they're, um, why they're having acute urinary retention. And the ratio of men to women that have um, urinary retention that requires ER visits is 13 to one. So it's a pretty highly favored in men more than women, uh, but just keep it in the differential for women as well. So there are four main groups of acute urinary retention, structural, medication, or tox, neuro, and infectious. In structural, that's about 75% of reasons that people have urinary retention. BPH is two thirds of that. So BPH is often the, the correct answer on the test, um, but obviously on the test, they're looking out for those zebras. So just keep that in mind. Um, Anyone that has BPH can really have a, um, can really be predisposed. Like let's say they start an anticholinergic, they can be pushed over the edge and uh, go into a, um, acute urinary retention, just keep that in mind. And then people that have acute urinary retention, about 41% of those that had BPH because of it had another reason um, associated with it. So people had neoplasms, um, they had renal dysfunction to be sure to send that BNP at the end. And then other reasons could be comp compressive masses, constipation, clot retention, urethral strictures, things like that. In kids, we got to think about neoplasm. We got to think about posterior urethral valves and congenital issues. It's not a pen lecture. I'm not going to go into that right now. But those are the things to think about with the, the kids. In terms of uh, medication and tox, um, these are a bunch of medications that can cause urinary retention. Um, in tox, yeah. Allergics. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, and coffee and I'll, I'll make my own breakfast. I'm going to have yogurt. Um, no. Thank you. Happy birthday. Dr. Z, we can hear you. All right. Okay. That's okay. Um, Basically, uh, anticholinergics will cause a decrease in bladder contractility. Other things that have anticholinergic-like uh, effects are NSAIDs and calcium channel blockers like nifedipine. Super common, and I found it really interesting that those can actually lead to acute urinary retention as well. Opiates will inhibit the acetylcholine from releasing from the postganglionic neurons, leading to decreased sympathetic tone in the bladder, leading to the urinary retention. Um, you got to think about those people that are on high doses of loperamide for the diarrhea or um, a lot of buprenorphine as an outpatient. And then sympathomimetics, the alpha stimulation in the bladder neck cause it to squeeze down and uh, lead to urethral sphincter resistance and some issues there. And then neurowise, you have an entire slew of like the entire pathway. It starts in the central, goes to peripheral, down to the UT, uh, urinary tract, and then neuromuscular dysfunction as well. Um, something, some like syndromes that have it are Parkinsonism, about 50% of patients with Parkinson's have urinary retention diabetes, MS, and um, I found something interesting was that people with Guillain-Barre, about 10% of them will have acute urinary retention, and that'll be their first presenting sign. Um, it'll happen about 24 hours before they actually have other signs as well. And we always think about cauda equina syndrome, every back pain that comes in, we always give the red flag questions, and then uh, spinal cord injuries. Third, three quarters of those patients will have bladder dysfunction of some sort. And then you also have infections, generally UTIs, um, pancreas of E. coli, but also can be ESPL. And think about prostatitis, pelvic abscess, and sacral herpes zoster, which sounds like an absolute nightmare. Uh, but one of the things that can um, happen is urinary retention as a first line um, as well. 
Evaluation, what are you going to think about? Um, identify the etiology. Nonverbal patients, you need to think about people that having delirium, agitation, nonspecific complaints, especially in kids like that. History, um, the most, re most uh, likely reason to have urinary retention again, or a predictor, is to have urinary retention within the last year. 68% of those that had it will have it again. And like I said, age kind of determines the symptoms that you look out for. Patients less than 60 are going to have um, urinary, like a weak stream, I'm sorry, a start and stop stream versus patients that are greater than 60, the relative risk of having um, a weak stream is like very high compared to a younger patient population, 3.4 to uh, 0.8. Get a good history, your drugs, your new medications, your GU neuro um, symptoms. And then patients that have high caffeine use have increased risk of acute urinary retention. So good luck, uh, make sure to slow down the, the caffeine as you get older and smokers have less of a risk of acute urinary retention. In terms of your physical exam, um, think about your, for men, you got to think about your prostate as the most common cause. Like we said, three quarters of the reason for this is, is the prostate. Enlarged mainly makes us think sometimes about acute prostatitis. Um, there's no really, and with that comes the sphere of starting a Foley because that can cause a prostatic uh, abscess. Um, but there actually haven't been any good studies uh, that show that that's a, a, like a cause and effect kind of relationship. Also look out for your neuro um, signs and infectious signs. And for females, consider your GYN exam because uh, they can lead to have these large pelvic masses that can be causing what's going on. And then in urethral injury and trauma patients, um, you need to look at blood in the meatus. That's the biggest thing that's gonna be causing. A high riding prostate is not very sensitive. It's about 15% sensitive. Um, maybe not worth a trauma handshake for that reason, but maybe worth it for the bladder tone. I'm sorry, the sphincter tone. And then imaging wise, you're obviously going to use your focus. Like one of the first things we learned uh, in turn year in the giant sauna rotation. So um, greater than 100 mLs is post, post void is going to be indicative. Um, and some people use the 300 mL cutoff as well. Um, and then the other thing that we can look out for is hydro um, to see how high these uh, or how high the, the backup goes. And then for your urethral um, meatus injuries, something you can do is get your AP uh, pelvis x-ray and that if there's pubic symphysis like disruption is a pretty high predictor that you have your urethral meatus injury. And then mix that with your uh, blood at the meatus, um, you got about 100% sensitive for urethral meatus injury, which I thought was pretty interesting. Get your labs, CBC, UA, U culture, BMT for your electrolytes um, and your creatinine. And then in an acute situation, PSA is actually not very helpful. Um, urinary retention can actually lead to increased PSA. So don't, that's not usually helpful. There are the treatment. What do we do? We need to relieve this, this stress, right? We need to get the urine out. That's the whole reason that the patient came in. We got to get it out. So you're going to use a catheter of some sort. You got to give meds to increase the chance of uh, trial avoid if you're going to keep a catheter in there, which you generally are in the ER, and then address the underlying etiology. It comes back to those four main groups again. And then there are three types of catheters. You have your chronic indwelling fully through the urethra, um, short-term drainage of the bladder, a superpubic catheter, which is the most invasive, um, this person in the picture with the superpubic catheter on the right there actually um, had tried self-cathing for about a year. Then they moved on to a urethral catheter and the spasms from her bladder were so bad that she's like, I can't take this anymore. And actually had to be put on a uh, superpubic catheter. And there's actually an interesting blog post that I read from her on her life of living in the superpubic catheter. It's actually not that bad. Um, and intermittent is uh, just removing after each drainage. And then just a little bit of pros and cons of urethral versus suprapubic. So 87% of the catheters around the world are gonna be uh, urethral. SPC has a lower incidence of infection, 14, 40 versus 19%. Hematuria is less likely in the suprapubic catheter. It's more comfortable, easier to manage by patients. It's less painful. And it also prevents urethral trauma and stricture that can form as a result of having the catheter in the urethra for so long. There's also less interference in sexual activity. But there is a risk of higher dislodgement in suprapubic catheters, as well as higher rate of bladder stones. Um, and basically, something that I thought was really interesting, a case series saw 17 ER residents that placed suprapubic catheters under attending uh, supervision. All of them were successful and none had complications. I'm sure that's a huge selection bias um, and there's a tiny, tiny power. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind. This can be done in the ER and we are successful when we have the right supervision and training. Indications for this is urethral pelvic surgery, urethral pelvic trauma. Again, you can't put a, something up into a urethra that can't take it. Um, you haven't, you've tried and you can't get a urethral catheter. Um, and I thought the other interesting indication I found was a patient that's wheelchair bound that basically a pressure ulcer will form 
if they have a urethral injury uh, there, uh, a urethral catheter rather, they're sitting um, and pulling on the urethra. Contraindications, if you can't find the bladder, you don't do the procedure, period. Um, even an ultrasound in kids, it's really hard to identify sometimes and you can do it with the ultrasound and that's what I would suggest and what we're gonna go over. Um, but it's really not advisable to just blindly poke in there and see what happens. There's too, many, too much bowel and other um, organs around there. Bowel anterior to the bladder wall. If you're gonna perf something, don't do it. Pregnancy is not a good idea to go poke around with a baby in there. And then gross or morbid obesity. If you can't find the bladder, you have difficulty with the operation, it's not, not indicated. Relative is uncontrolled coagulopathy. If you're gonna bleed a lot, there's issue of hematoma and anytime you deal with needles and, and cutting, blood can happen and bleeding can happen. So we maybe wanna think about what we wanna do there. Pediatric patients, I don't think it's necessarily relative, but it was on the list of one of the things. And then prior abdominal or pelvic surgery is all the pelvic radiation that can lead to adhesions and scarring and everything else that leads to complications with surgeries that are in the pelvis. The risk of doing this procedure, you got, uh, if you do it blind, it's 2.1%. Um, and if you do it at all, it's a 1.8% mortality. For very low risk, very low chance of having any issue. You're gonna run the risk of bowel perforation, hematoma, uh, hematuria, perforation in the, the area around there, infection and tube displacement as well. So how do we do this thing? Because uh, when I looked it up, I was like, this is kind of intimidating. Basically what you do, if you can do a pigtail, you can do a superfluid catheter. And if you can do a central line, you can do a superfluid catheter. It's really not that weird. It's just something that we just don't do a lot in here, which is why I wanted to go over it today. So what you're gonna do is identify the bladder on ultrasound or on palpation. I would suggest again, ultrasound and doing this under um, dynamic guidance of the ultrasound. You're gonna anesthetize making a wheel on the skin after cleansing it, of course. And then entering with a spinal needle about four and a half, so four to five centimeters above the pubic symphysis. And you're gonna aim caudally. You're gonna aim down towards their pelvis. Um, once you get down to the pelvis and you're aspirating urine, you're gonna mark and think about, okay, this is the angle I took and the depth that I took to get to the bladder, because that's gonna be really important. If you just plunge the needle every time, you're gonna run the risk of perforation or something like that, okay? Um, so you're gonna get the operator, basically, you're gonna start with the system out of the skin, again, going down to the 60 degree angle. Now that you know what track you've made with the numbing medicine as you go, of course, aspirating first and then injecting medication, aspirating, injecting until you get urine. Then you're gonna take your system and you're gonna have the obturator in the, um, within the catheter. You're gonna go 60 degrees down towards the pelvis. And again, you're gonna go through the linear album. That's kind of tough. Um, so realize you're gonna hit resistance right away. You're gonna go through that. And you're gonna hit like some freedom and you're gonna hit resistance again. And that's probably your bladder, especially if you're using ultrasound, you can confirm that's your bladder. And then you're gonna get um, into the bladder itself with a rapid stabbing motion. The thing is the bladder is kind of distensible based on how much urine is in there. Um, and you, wanna don't, you don't wanna just push the bladder down slowly. You need to get through the bladder itself um, with the rapid stabbing motion. Then urine should flow spontaneously. If you're not getting spontaneous flow and you know you're in the bladder, just grab a syringe, hook it up to the top and withdraw some urine, just like you would um, in like a pigtail system. You wanna make sure that you get air back, right? Um, and then advance the unit about two to three centimeters more to make sure you're all the way in there. Then you're going to uh, blow up the cuff with 10 ml of saline, take out the trocar, leaving the catheter in place, pulling back until just like a regular urethral catheter, you're gonna pull back and make sure you're against the bladder wall and then suture it or secure it in place in any way you see fit. Now here comes the, uh, the central line part. If you don't, and one of the things I read is like in a, a dire situation, if you don't have a super, super pubic catheter kit, just grab a central line kit, it's the same exact thing. Just throw it in there as well. So you're gonna numb up just like we talked about before. You're going to locate the bladder. And once the bladder is located, you're gonna put the syringe on the spinal needle, advancing just the same 60 degree angle, four to five centimeters above where you numbed up. And you're gonna go until you withdraw um, urine. Once you're there, you're gonna take off the, uh, the syringe. You're gonna insert your guide wire. You're gonna take, take out your needle. You're gonna make a nick with your 11 blade in the stabbing motion. I'm going through exactly what the steps are for essential line if you're not picking up what I'm, I'm going for here. And you're gonna advance your dilator and catheter over the guide wire. It's one of those peel away systems usually, um, just like the midlines at Kings County. So you gotta keep that in mind. They're super annoying sometimes, but it is really helpful. Once you're in there with your guide wire and catheter, you're gonna take out your trocar, you're gonna take out your guide wire and leave the catheter, I'm uh, sorry, leave the, uh, the, the catheter, the sheath inside. Um, I keep saying catheter, but I mean, leave the sheath inside. Then you're gonna pass your Foley through the sheath, inflate the balloon and pull back and secure it just like you would the other stuff, okay? Um, a small video 
on how to do this. Basically, this, this is a urologist uh, with their attending set next to them. They numbed up the area with lidocaine, they palpated the bladder. They're gonna using a spinal needle to first inject the, the numbing medicine, and they're gonna identify it with the spinal needle. Now they're, they're stabbing first. Um, I don't advise that, but that was the method that they used in their, in their uh, procedure. And it looks like they're using a crusade kind of incision to make it wide enough for the trocar that they have to go in. Their trocar is different than the one that I showed you in the picture. And you'll see it and you'll be like, what the heck is that? Because it looks massive and like crazy, um, but it is uh, appropriate. I also wouldn't just let the needles kind of drop personally, but uh, urology do what it do. So she's getting urine, she's flashing back. So she knows, she knows how, what her angle would be, right? She recognized the angle she needs to take about 60 degrees down. And she's withdrawing to find the spot that she can like withdraw what you're in still. So she knows how deep she needs to go with the trocar. Because again, this trocar, you'll see it, it's big. If you go through that, that bladder, you are damaging things and you're going to have to go to the OR. Um, always make sure that this skin in particular, whether you know, uh -huh. okay. and fast is an understatement. You'll see how quickly this urine comes out, it's crazy. I mean, you saw that guy's his belly, it's like huge. So. so that big thing with the orange tip is the cat is the trocar that they're using. It's it's just one piece instead of like the system altogether, like I showed you on the other picture. Theirs is a separate piece together and it has a peel away um, sheath. The urine's coming out of the top. Okay. And she starts to peel away the sheet. Okay. That's what she says, pulling down. Okay. And a fountain of, of yellow gold comes out. And then you put it in your urinary catheter. So you want to get it in the back slot because the bladder will be compressed. Yeah. I thought that was a really interesting point that if you just let it pour out, your bladder is going to shrink and you may not have your space anymore to get you. You may have like a different movement. I just pull it out. And then they're going to suture theirs in place. Um, and that's it. It's a lot more set up than the actual, the actual procedure. Like every procedure we do, right? And we're not going to talk about what, what you're in. Thank you. Um, so what can go wrong with these things? Complications can include soft bowel obstruction, happens days to weeks after the procedure happens. Obviously, adhesions form. Anytime you enter the abdomen, it can happen. Um, so look out for your distension, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. It can be secondary to displacement of the catheter, or it can happen because of a routine catheter exchange. The patients are able to do this. I had a patient at Downstate. She changes her catheter like all the time. Unfortunately, um, has like issues with it sometimes, but uh, it's something that she does on her own and it's painless or pain, it's less pain rather. And um, it's good for her in her situation. Then you also have uh, the complication of bladder perfor bowel perforation. That can happen, has been reported to happen up to three years after placement of the, um, of the catheter itself. So it can also happen just from a routine catheter exchange. So something benign as just switching out the catheters can cause these things. And what can go wrong? What if it's stuck? Doc, I tried to switch it out. I can't get it out for some reason. It doesn't work. I'm not sure what's going on here. So can, uh, there are several reasons it can happen. Uh, one is a uh, cuff can form. Uh, the cuff being obviously your balloon is here. So I'm going to put it over here so I can see a little better. Your balloon, uh, your Foley balloon is here. And what happens is when we overinflate it sometimes, and when we rapidly deflate it, or it's just been stretched out enough, a little cuff can form. And that's this little out pouching right here. It can get caught in the bladder wall before you hit the urethra, or it can get caught in the prostate in males. Um, as well. And the way that you address this, uh, if you think you have this issue, is to just inflate about one to a half an ml of, of water or something in there, and it smooths out the edges and just makes it a little bit smoother for it to, to come out naturally, um, or when you pull it. The other thing that could happen is a balloon just doesn't deflate. There's some sort of issue going on between the inflation system, whether that's the, the valve itself, it's the tubing itself, or it's the balloon itself. So you got to think about your whole anatomy of the system. So the first thing that they suggest is to cut off the valve. If air leak or the fluid or whatever is in the, the fully leaks out, just let it go and you're great. Pull it out, remove it. If that's not solving your problem, grab a cinch line kit. Again, with this damn cinch line. Um, you're gonna grab the, the, 
the guide wire from it using the blunt end, you're gonna enter into the lumen of the uh, inflation device. And you're going to see if there's some sort of mechanical obstruction blocking the exit, basically. Once you're in there and you found a mechanical obstruction, great, pop it open and everything should start leaking out. Now, the thing is, if it doesn't leak out, then you have issues, right? If your guide wire is all the way in the Foley balloon and you're still not emptying, what you can do is just take the central line and put it over the guide wire into the Foley and withdraw all the fluid from the Foley balloon. Does that make sense? So it's just a simple Selinger's technique to try to empty whatever is in there. Um, if that's still not working, you got to call your valve and get them on the horn because uh, the next thing is uh, that you'd have to do is extra luminal balloon puncture, which is uh, as dangerous as it sounds. Basically, you would take an angiocath, a long one that has a sheath over it, right? You have the, the plastic catheter. Um, you're going to put the catheter a little bit beyond the, the, the needle tip to protect as much of the skin as you can and the internal structure as you can and the foley as you can because you won't want to rip that and cause injury to that. And using the tract that you have formed by placing a supertuber catheter, you're going to follow the Foley into the, um, into the area until you hit resistance, which should be the Foley balloon in the bladder itself. Once you feel that resistance, you push the needle through and you puncture the balloon and the, what should happen is all of the fluid or air, or whatever is gonna leak into the bladder and everything should go smoothly. Um, this isn't, really should be done with urology console and discussion because it is a little bit more hazardous of a situation. Um, the biggest thing that we should not do is inflate it till it pops and just blows up. Not a good idea. That debris can just sit in there and cause um, not only trauma to the bladder, but also um, can block up the urinary tract as well. You don't want to blindly stab at the thing, you know, even under ultrasound guidance. And obviously, I'm sorry, I didn't mention this, but the extra luminal bladder, uh, extra luminal balloon puncture should be done under ultrasound guidance. Don't blindly, blindly stab at the, the balloon, trying to empty it. That's just not a good idea. And don't instill chemicals into the Foley balloon to try and dissolve it. Um, that chemical has to go somewhere and, and the pieces are gonna go and block up the urinary tract, just like we talked about before. And the other thing that can happen is that there's encrustations that can form. Um, this is a very extreme example, obviously, uh, but basically they're from biofilm and protease uh, bacteria that deposit onto the catheter. And really think about this as a complication if you um, have deflated the balloon and there is still urinary retention because the, the biofilm is like crushing the Foley and you still can't get the, the Foley out even though you've deflated it. It may just be a huge biofilm that's crusted around the Foley itself and that you can't do anything about. You gotta call urology um, for a possible um, cystoscopy and possibly is placing a second supercuted catheter. So in conclusion, be sure to identify your causes of acute urinary retention when you have your patients. Uh, females and kids have scarier reasons generally to have acute urinary retention. So keep them higher on your differential um, and more like higher suspect. Consider SPC uh, in those with contraindications or urethral injuries. Um, use your ultrasound to help with the procedure. Please do ultrasound and guidance. Um, and I forgot to mention, you should always check once you've placed everything that you have decompression of your bladder and your Foley balloon is in the bladder. Uh, it's also an important piece. If you can do a central line or a pigtail, you can place an SPC and be sure to be in close contact with your urologist uh, for com complications of the cerebral catheter, especially if it's stuck. Any questions, comments, concerns? Um, and I totally agree. I think if you think about this as a elongated vessel, 